Hello and welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Uh, from Switzerland today, uh, bonjour. And Fen? From the middle of the Baltic Sea. Hello, help, could you send a boat? <laughs> we don't need one, we're on an island. <laughs> And I am your host of the day, Audrey. Today we're going to be talking about Slave Aspire, Terrifying Mars and Verdant. But first of all, it's time for the last Andy catch-up. Alexis, it's been a few weeks since I have heard of you. What have you been up to? Well, uh, as I mentioned uh, a second ago, uh, I'm currently in Switzerland. Uh, I decided to try taking the bus this time to see how easy it would be to, to come all the way over here. And my bus was supposed to arrive at 3 a.m. It stopped at 1 a.m. around Nancy in France and uh, got stuck there for eight hours because of a suspension problem. So I had a very um, eventful night, but I finally managed to get here. Um, it is also oh, the first grève. time that I oh, opened grève. Kingdom... Oh, grève. <laughs> oh, grève. <laughs> it is also the first time that I opened uh, Kingdom Death in a long time. Uh, it was very dusty and I've been um, planning to, to start a game maybe this weekend. Um, slightly looking forward to whatever this, this um, Black Friday is going to bring. Probably only gloom new, uh, news, but um, you know, some people have to keep hope uh, here and there. Uh, it's probably just going to be delayed another year. Who knows? Um, Otherwise, uh, nothing, nothing much, uh, nothing super exciting recently. Uh, what about you, Finn? How, how have you been uh, recently? Well, um, before we get to how I've been, I thought I'd just reference, as you're talking about Kingdom Death, one of my community members just today posted um, a screenshot from uh, this month last year where the Gambler's Chest expansion was listed as almost finished and off to print February 2022. Oh yeah, it was just a two two month-ish uh, away from being released, mm -hmm. uh, which turned into over a year because it's definitely not going to be printed by February uh, 2023. It's probably going to be March or uh, April or maybe October, who knows. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Uh, that felt very timely and appropriate. And also it's a, an incredible reminder of this, that this 40 year old man is still trying to get his second, no, his expansion to his first game out, his big expansion. Anyway, so more specifically what uh, I've been up to, um, well, I was present in the last podcast and uh, I didn't do a catch up then um, for technical reasons. So I took our dog on our cargo bike uh, on a ride um, just two days ago. It's the first ever time riding in a bike. For those of you who aren't aware what a cargo bike is, which is probably a small number, it's a bike with a box on it built into it. In this case, big enough to hold a dog and a parcel. So is it a, is it a big dog or is it a small uh, cargo Pam, bike? Pam is around 20 to 22 kilograms. She's... Uh, she's got very short legs for her body size. Um, the vet describes her as a very compact dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it fit. She fit in with a parcel and that was about the limit of the box. Um, but uh, it was a whole gamut of emotions for her because initially she tried jumping out over the front. And she was belted in. So she ended up just hanging off there on her harness like sadly staring at me like why did you do this to me and i'm like you did this to yourself pam so i put her back in and she just shook with like fear for the first 100 200 meters as she was like this is awful this is the worst i don't like this because she hates new things she's not a dog who's like ooh something new she just hates it but by the time we got to um the the place to pick up the package she was like oh actually this isn't so bad um, until I loaded the package in and then she tried jumping out while I was crossing the road with her. So I had to oh, stop, no. tell her off, get her back into the thing. Luckily, though, it's low traffic, you know, it's, it's, it's rural, so it's, it wasn't too bad. And then after that, she was tongue out, sticking her head over the side. This is the best thing ever. So um, uh, she grew to like it by the end. And we picked up, uh, we got Warp's Edge, a bag builder, Boss Battler, very excited about that. Uh, Flamecraft, um, just the basic version. I didn't oh, see yeah. the point. I saw you. You were basically filling your uh, your sleigh with uh, with toys. I saw. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I got Scout because after Tom 
Brewster on Shut Up and Sit Down reviewed it. I was like, I need this Oink game to put with my other Oink games because this one seems really good. Um, fungi, which I got because my partner likes picking fungi uh, mushrooms but hates eating them. And fungi is about picking them and eating them. Uh, Onitama, which is a two-player abstract uh, with the worst boxes for expansions I've ever seen and I'll probably talk about in the future. My Marvel Champions, that was uh, talked about in a previous episode. And uh, the Mindbug Kickstarter box, which I don't know if Alessio talked about it when he talked about Mindbug. Because I don't the, remember him mentioning no. something about the Kickstarter at all. I mean, yeah. m- b- yeah. besides that it was a Kickstarter. Yeah, so the, the game comes in a tiny little card box, yeah? Like the actual game itself. This Kickstarter box is about the length of half a Kingdom Death box, smaller um, and not quite so deep. Uh, but it has two mats in it and then this exceptionally long tray down the middle and you put the cards that come in it and they sit on the right-hand side and there's just 90% of the box down the middle is still empty. So obviously they're planning to put a ton of expansions out for that game. Fill it up. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I want more expansions for the game. It's all right, but... You know, yeah. at least you have a box for it. Yeah, I have a box for the new stuff if it turns up. Oh, and um, I got we got Caverna Cave versus Cave because dwarfs and farming is yeah, sweet and it's less nonsense than the giant big box. So yeah, that was it. Bike ride for a dog to pick up a load of board games and she hated it and then she loved it. <laughs> so uh, what have you been up to, Audrey? Uh, me. I'm I'm still in the zone of not having much to talk about, but uh, I have ended a dilemma of mine about the Queen's Dilemma. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I was... Uh, I long hesitated to pledge, then pledged, and then I actually thought that I still do not have a group that I am sure would play it uh, to the end, which is a first... Let's say, not not problem, but uh, at first, not great reason to get it. Um, and at some point, I thought, yeah, but why would I need that Kickstarter exclusive expansion anyway? R- really, why? Yeah, you you can always grab it later, and it might even become cheaper. E- yeah. exa- exactly. There seems to be so much in that uh, Kickstarter exclusive expansion that I wouldn't need so i ended up by uh taking my pledge off and completely um for, for, for blah, 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 forgetting about it until it hits uh retail and maybe uh, i i would probably not get it a uh, second hand because even after one game played you don't put it back uh perfect let's say for a start but probably yeah w- wait one year, one year and a half after retail and probably wait for a discount or something, that will probably be um, my pick. Yeah, I think you've landed exactly where I am on it. I was like, ooh, very excited. Then I saw the price and I was not so excited. And then they fiddled with the price a bit and I was like, that's not so bad. But I I then remembered I have a, a copy of sealed copy of The King's Dilemma upstairs still. Um, and the only way we've been able to play it is like online through the TTS mod that got discontinued. So I was like, why am I, why am I going to buy the Queen's Dilemma as much as I want to support it? When am I going to play it? Yeah. Yeah. It, at some point it's like, yeah, you, there are so many conditions to meet, to have it because for, for instance, let's say, let, let's speak, uh, even though we have our own graves with it, Kingdom Death. The group can't meet. Okay, if you are, let's say, um, brave, you can still run it solo. Yeah, it won't be the same. The characters won't, the survivors don't want to be exactly the same. But who cares? It's not an RPG. So you can still feel it. You can still play it. You, you can go to the end. But with the king or queen cinema, if someone stops, you're just stuck. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In my opinion, there is a lot to take into account to commit to it because even if for, with the king's dilemma you do two queen, two kings in a session you're still at seven session of two hours ish uh, which is a lot yeah and, and on top of that i don't know how better they made the queen's dilemma on that regard but 
I remember that the King's Dilemma is very hard to replay. There's a lot of things that you kind of kind of kind of only can do once, and then replaying it, you might uh, uh, you know run against the, the legacy system. Uh, if someone leaves midway, like restarting it from the start is going to be a bit uh, complicated. Yeah, I I exactly. So that led me to this uh, final decision. You went all in. No, no, no. I, I, I didn't <laughs> get any. I didn't get anything. Uh, instead, I will uh, wait for Black Friday and get me uh, a, a, a phone that I should not be reasonably getting. But that's um, <clears throat> Pixel Seven Pro. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm going to be taking much better miniature pictures with a phone that does handle a shorter distance. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, there's that, and also there has been the recent announcement uh, from Atomis. Atomic Mass Games, which uh, you know I follow, uh, at least on the Marvel Crisis Protocol game, since I talked about it uh, in an episode and kept referencing it, especially my Sentinels. Uh, anyway, um, they announced uh, that they have a game coming for Star Wars, a skirmish game. Um, Shadow, Shadow, I don't remember the name, but it starts with an S, uh, which helps you a lot. <laughs> And uh, it might be a game uh, on which I will buy one or two characters back. I will probably not uh, get into it fully like with VMCP. Uh, but uh, when there is really Ahsoka, for instance, I might grab her. And I think that's going to be very interesting as well to see if they have uh, the same scale as the MCP characters, which are slightly bigger than what uh, Legion is. So for people that like Star Wars and want to paint some Star Wars characters at a 35, 40 uh, scale, um, at a 40 millimeter scale, I think that's going to be a great option uh, to have yeah, that larger size and not be stuck on tiny details like on the scale of Legion. Mm. Doesn't it feel like at times that almost every board game thing is trying to become this lifestyle? Like that, I see so many things being launched now. And they're like, "Hey!" and then get ready for the sequel and the expansion and this and this. Yeah. I say with uh, with Arkham Horror cards on my table, like right in front of me right now. <laughs> well, for, for for a card game like this, that makes a little bit more sense because that's always been kind of the the thing with card games. But for a lot of board games, it kind of feel like they do that to to push the Kickstarter because the uh, that's a good way to to promote a, a game. Like you get in early, and then you, later on you'll you'll get like a you have more FOMO basically. Yeah, for me, for me, it feels like in a way some board game uh, producers have I will not say figured out, but. Uh, are taking inspiration from these uh, collectible card games and uh, in a way I, I can't fault them for wanting to have a secured uh, business future and wanting to keep the company afloat uh, but yeah I'm, I'm looking at the MCP and uh, at some point they will run out of popular characters I mean yeah there, there is still Mantis, there is still Cosmo, there are still uh, Scroll Girl uh, many uh, I'm, I'm not citing all the characters that are missing I'm still waiting for Nightcrawler please Nightcrawler um, but yeah there are still so, so many um, Marvel and X-Men characters to, to add to the game but at some point they will run out and they are starting to do re-releases with the updated skulls and I don't know when this is going to stop but at the same time I can't fault a company for wanting to let's say last longer and then I see currently uh, being delivered the Everdell complete collection where you have everything in a big box and some people are like yeah I'm selling my core game because I'm buying it again in the collection what? that's me hello <laughs> yeah, it, was cheap. it was cheaper to rebuy the complete collection than bother trying to figure out all the separate pieces I needed. Yeah, which and, uh, which is completely understandable, but at some point, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a waste unless you can resell, and then everyone is wrestling Everdell, and I I well, I don't know. It seems we are done with a catch-up, so we are going to ask a very important question, which is, what happens when you, you turn a video card game into a not video card game? Alexis is going to talk to us about Slave Aspire. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
That is a very uh, interesting question because Slay the Spire was first a very popular roguelike, uh, roguelike deck building game. Um, that kind of started that recent wave on Steam and in uh, some consoles uh, of a computerized card game with some roguelike aspect. There's a lot of them. Uh, it came a little bit after Ends of Fate, but Ends of Fate wasn't as big as Slay the Spire, it seemed. Um, and after that, there's been a, there's been a bunch more. Um, it only makes sense that at some point someone decided to launch a board game version of uh, the popular uh, video game board game. Uh, and I tried that uh, board game version of a video game board game on tabletop simulators, finalizing uh, the loop. Um, <laughs> so joke aside, it's currently a Kickstarter that ends on the 17th of November with a delivery estimated uh, next year around December. So I think that it's very important because it's the adaptation of a computer game to introduce the, that game first and comparing uh, the two because they, it's kind of hard to separate them. Uh, if you're buying the board game version, it's probably because you played the video game. Uh, the computer version is a solo game with runs that last between uh, 40 to 60 minutes, uh, going to three acts with one of four different characters, fighting mobs, picking new cards for your deck, pruning your deck, uh, upgrading your cards and collecting artifacts that drastically change the way that you face and counter. That was actually one of the big thing about the game where some of those artifacts can completely change the way that uh, you're going to experience things. For example, um, instead of uh, flushing your energy at the end of your turn, you can accumulate it and keep uh, going with that same energy pool. Uh, so if you economize it, you can pay for a bigger card later. Uh, some of them are very interesting and can change the game. The game is hard, but uh, a good run has tendency to snowball. Uh, more often than not, when you'll win a game of Slay the Spire, it's because you maneuvered yourself into a super strong combo. Um, one of the uh, strongest points of Slay the Spire is the fact that a lot of monsters uh, will often do the same action in the same order uh, and will always announce what they are going to do on the next turn. So each mob that you'll encounter has some kind of pattern or personality. Uh, for example, the thieves will attack and steal money twice, then defend, then run away. Uh, the cultist will attack each turn, getting stronger every turn. Uh, the shell will attack, then debuff, then attack, then debuff. Um, this allows you to mitigate a lot of what in other games is just treated as randomness and creates a game that feels rewarding with a lot of uh, control over what happens. And that also works very well with the fact that it is... Um, uh, a deck building game. So the whole point is that you try to minimize randomness and try to play against that. I feel that the both of the ideas work well. So before yeah. I move on to the board game, uh, I wanted um, to know if uh, both of you have played the, the video game. I've played the video game and I wanted to say before that off your point, um, this signaling the AI in advance, um, Oathsworn, that's what Oathsworn does. And the Monster Hunter board game is going to do it to a certain degree. I actually think it's a much more engaging and interesting mechanic. I love the decks that get used in AI control decks and things like that. Um, I genuinely think that the experience is better for the players when you kind of know what's coming and you have to make decisions based around that. Because Oswald really sold how good a boss battler is with this face-up AI. Um, and yeah, that, that's something I like about Slay the Spy, the video game. Um, I've played it a little bit, uh, yeah. so I'm I'm fairly familiar with everything. Um, I'll be honest, I've played it until I kind of almost fed up with it, but it's something really easy to click on. Yeah, I've played 272 hours. So I've played it <laughs> I, I think I've, I played 300 hours myself. It's yeah. a very addicting uh, game. Yeah, I, I mostly just, I can't be bothered to do the high ascension stuff because I just yeah. want to play it to chill a little bit. Um, it, it's fun when it snowballs, the high ascension has less tendency to snowball and more tendency of, oh, I run into like a bad situation for me and my deck is not ready for this, then I, I just have to restart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, have you played it, Audrey? No. 
Okay. <laughs> well, that that uh, that rounds that up. Uh, yeah, yeah no, I, so, sorry, uh, the only deck building uh, game that I've played were Clunk, which I didn't like, and Eonzen that I love. So that's all my references. <laughs> um, it is a it is a bit like Eonzen in some uh, in yeah. some aspects. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, to come back on what you said. Uh, the the announcing what the enemy is going to do is. Something that I think that uh, Slater Spire brought to the genre, at least in the video game uh, side, I maybe some uh, board game uh, inspired it first, maybe it inspired some board game afterwards, but at least in the the, the video game deck builders, uh, Slater Spire was that was the thing that yeah. put it uh, above other games, yeah. and yeah, it's absolutely. very yeah. engaging. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would say it is definitely the. Um, like what the biggest one that did this did this and made people realize that really just well. because you know what the enemy is going to do in advance it doesn't have to be easier in fact you can go harder on what the enemy is going to do and they can be meaner and nastier because people should be prepared so it, yeah it really works well yeah yeah and like exactly. we talked previous episode about pandemic style games yeah, uh, yeah definitely in that in that way too uh, it's also really interesting that you can have each enemy has its personality because of that, and it doesn't feel like they're random because you see those same patterns multiple times. So you know, oh, this enemy like is a berserker; is just going to get stronger and stronger every time that you try to defend. And so it becomes, uh, whenever you fight that berserker enemy, you need to think about when you want to defend, like which attack you want to try to cancel, knowing that it will make the rest of the fight harder. It's a very engaging mechanic. Uh, something that the board game version is going to try to bring to the table. So the board game isn't exactly a straight adaptation of it. Uh, it turns the solo game into a one to four player game uh, and adapts a lot of the video game uh, cards, deck, enemies and artifacts into something that fits the viable and amount of player, but also simplifies the game to get around the lack of a computer that will calculate the damage you'll do and keep track of multiple effects going on at the same time. Uh, in, the in the video game, you have 80 uh, HP and most enemies have between uh, 20 for extremely small enemies to 200 for bigger ones. Uh, in the board game version, uh, the players have uh, 9 HP, I think, when they start. 9 or 10, I don't remember. Uh, and the enemies run between uh, just a couple of HP to uh, the, the bosses having up to uh, 60 HP for um, a full party. Um, the amount of player that you're going to have is going to regulate how many monsters you're going to, f to fight. Each player is going to basically like draw uh, multiple monsters and how much HP the uh, big boss is going to be. Uh, as I tried the game, I tried uh, both a solo with a friend and a solo with a four uh, party. Um, I think that the balance, at least in the demo that they released on uh, on Tabletop Simulator at the moment, isn't really there. It kind of feels like the game was thought of for four players and the solo game, uh, they give you some little advantages, but it feels very um, unbalanced in some aspect. And, uh, you know, with multiple player, you have that advantage that you can have one player that focuses on defending, one player that focuses on attacking. You can uh, do a lot of different combos with it. It's more interesting. Uh, the solo game, unfortunately, they didn't capture what made the base game uh, good. Uh, Funnily enough, that's what got me with ISS Vanguard and switched me off it was the game feels balanced for four characters. If you try and play with just two sections as they recommend in the solo mode, it doesn't, you end up going back to play it multiple times and it gets tiring for me. Um, and then if you play with all four sections, the game works and feels balanced, but then you're dealing with building four decks, everything. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the um, keeping track of four uh, characters at the same time as I tried it uh, feels very hard, especially since there's a lot of manipulation that you're going to have to do. It's not just uh, putting the cards down, it's also like counting the HP, counting the defense, trying to keeping track of four battles at the same time and four decks at the same time. 
uh, well, there's a lot of one to four player games that you can basically play multiple characters at the same time, like Kingdom Death, um, Tainted Grail, uh, Oathstorm, um, any number of games that we could mention here, Midora, for example. Um, Slater Spire feels like one of those games where you could, but it seems very hard and very complicated, uh, more of a yeah. hassle than anything else. Strikes me a bit, uh, just reference back to the previous episode, a bit like trying to play Marvel Champions and people either play one of their own with a single hero or play with two. You rarely hear people talking about playing with three or four because even though each individual step isn't that much to do, it's and you you know you deal with one character in the moon with the other, it's such a mental load that it's exhausting and you mess up and you get lost. Especially with the enemy, you have to automate, you know, the enemy isn't automated, you have to handle that. So it's a lot. So I can see that. Yeah. You reference uh, Midara as well. I wouldn't play it uh, solo for four characters. Yeah, I wouldn't, but I could see it done. It's not the. It, it's one of the hardest one, but I feel it's still possible. Um, at least two to three, maybe. Uh, in any case, uh, the biggest difference with uh, this game is that. The length, well, not the biggest, but the first big difference that I noticed is the length of the game. Uh, each act takes about 30 minutes per player uh, that they recommend in the manual. Um, and the game is uh, still split into three acts. You can obviously take breaks in between each act and like put the game away and then put it back later. But it makes the game take a significant amount of time, um, you know, uh, with a... Um, with a full crew of four player, which is, in my opinion, the recommended way to play, it means that one act is going to take you two hours. If you want to do the full game, it's going to be six hours. Ugh. Yeah, that's a long time, especially since, in my opinion, a deck building game is something that you kind of want to play fast. Like, for example, um, Ion's Hand, uh, the game is wonderful because it, the rounds are very fast and very quick and you kind of get into it and then after you're done with the game you're like okay let's do another one um this one i feel like i would be exhausted after a full game um so the game tries to replicate a lot of the aspects of the main game still having artifacts still having uh, a lot of enemies and it tries to give those enemies the same um way that they will interact uh, they sometimes have a, a track that uh, that you tick down to say which action they're going to be uh, to do so you can see a little bit ahead of the time but some enemies act uh, by rolling a die that will tell you what they'll do on the next turn so you can st you still have that predictability of what will they do but it's randomized for certain enemies and that feels sometimes a little bit too um uh, haphazard uh, same with certain artifacts they only activate when the dice has been rolled into a certain way um, I felt like that slightly heavier relevance in randomness while not being a big deal kind of feels like it goes against the grain of what I really like about Slade Aspire. Uh, overall playing the game that that's kind of my my general opinion of it is that it kind of felt like I recognized certain patterns of Slade Aspire but it wasn't an adaptation of the video game it felt like an inspiration from the video game which is a little bit strange because the video game is in itself already a board game the the, the difference between the two while i understand why they're there um seems a bit strange to me um one of the fun little addiction, uh, addition of the board game on the physical aspect is that it comes with opaque sleeves and each card is double-sided with the upgraded side at the back of the, the card. Uh, so whenever you upgrade, you're going to ins uh, unsleeve the card, flip the card and re-sleeve it uh, into your deck. I think that's a ah. fun way to handle that. Uh, I kind of like the, the thing, but I don't know if having to constantly sleeve and unsleeve cards is going to be... Uh, fun in the long term you you want a bit of a, an example of whether it's fun or not i would love to yes my partner and i are currently playing edge of the earth for arkham horror and when we play we play with colored back cards uh, that match the class so purple for mystic green for rogue etc now edge of the earth has a separate deck called the 
Tiliki deck, I think it's pronounced. And it's a bunch of extra cards that randomly get drawn and shuffled into your deck. So because we play with unique backs, we have to draw those cards, sleeve those cards into the right colour, and then shuffle them into the deck. And I can tell you, we're ever so glad it doesn't happen too much during the thing, because it, uh, it gets really frustrating. And also, sleeves die while you're doing it. The more you sleeve and unsleeve, the more likely you put a card into the join between the two bits of plastic. And what normally happens is the cardboard slices the join open and you have to bin that sleeve. So I think it's a neat idea. I think it's really, it, it, really cool. But it and is I love a neat idea. games that use both sides, but it's put yeah, a lifespan on those cards. Yeah, that, time. That's, kind of, uh, that's kind of my thing. Thankfully, you don't upgrade too often. You might do it uh, maybe full time on a maximum if, play, if you play really well per act. So per, uh, I don't know, like couple of hour session uh, per character. But it still feels like it's it might be an issue in the long term. I, I like the idea though. I like the, the energy uh, of it. Um, one of the other aspects that I, uh, that I noticed uh, in the... Um, in the card game is that um, instead of the spire you don't uh, gain HP very often usually you are running on a single pool of HP that with every fight on every turn you're kind of going to mitigate should I defend myself or should I attack the enemy can I take 5 HP of damage and uh, later if I get to the boss with a smaller HP pool is it going to be okay there's a lot of Russell's mitigation in that aspect in the board game because you only have 10 HP every time that you take one damage it's going to cost you a lot if you take two that's uh, that's a massive setback uh, I found that the game was a little bit more exhausting in that aspect um, but maybe it gets easier in the long term maybe with different character I only tried uh, two of the of the four character that they, they have on offer uh, maybe it gets a little bit easier nicer uh, I, I can't really reflect on that overall um, I kind of have to point to the elephant in the room as you might have uh, noticed my uh, my review is not uh, extremely uh, empathetic um, and I, I, I loved uh, Slay the Spire, the video game. I played 300 hours of it. I, I'm a massive fan. When I saw that it was uh, on Kickstarter, I immediately backed it and then I decreased my pledge. Because if you want to play Slay the Spire solo, there already exists a better version for a fifth of the price. The Kickstarter, the game on Kickstarter is $100. That is a lot of money for a game like this. Um, and it only makes sense as a multiplayer game, in my opinion. So if you are a solo player, I really can't recommend it. Because if you want a better version of that game, just buy the video game version. Just, uh, just I, I've got it. a recommendation. Um, if you're a solo player and you really like uh, like it, uh, when you just take that money and put it towards get a Steam Deck so you can play Slay the Spire in more different places. Yeah, or, or buy uh, Aeon Zend. Uh, a much better game that uh, plays yeah. well on one player, on two player, and on four player, as far as I tried. Um, or the, the legacy version of it that is excellent, um, as Audrey can recommend. Totally. <laughs> um, one of, one thing that is important to point out, and I think that's that's kind of uh, going to be my point in the, the whole idea of adapting a video game, board game into a, a physical ones, is that it needs to keep what made the video game good. And by simplifying and changing the way that in function, obviously you can make it better for the table, but you have to remember that Slade Aspire was on early access for a year and a half, I think, and they did constant tiny updates of mitigating the balance and having feedback with the player and trying to figure out what worked, what didn't. And what makes the game good is that it has been fine-tuned by a lot of people that played a lot of games and a lot of deck building games. The I, I'm not going to say that the game is perfect, but the game has been balanced to uh, to perfection, almost. Uh, it has been well made, and that feels when you play the game, you know that you play something that has been like tried uh, for countless of hours, and you, you have that, that good feeling. And there's a lot of 
a lot of deck building games succeed because they feel that way, because they feel that the balance is so good. Um, that's that's what uh, brings people towards uh, some aspect of the uh, Magic the Gathering or some other collecti uh, uh, collecting card game. It feels good when you, you feel that every card um, is, is worth it or has a value or you could see how it functions. Um, and the problem is that the board game seems like it strays a bit too far away from that and can't really manage to grab people for the same reason that a video game grabbed, uh, grabbed people. So unfortunately, that's that's kind of my opinion, is that it seems good for four player. And I, I would say that it's it's probably a fun game for four player, but if you're buying it because you like the video game, eh. Anyway, um, that's my opinion on, on Slater Spire, a game that I was uh, extremely excited for and then uh, very much uh, not that excited anymore. You know what's gonna be interesting? Um, I should have some time in the next month having the Darkest Dungeon game arrived and I've heard early impressions from some other reviewers who've started playing it and that might be another case of why did they turn this into a board game? So um, I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes open and I hope it turns out to be really, really enjoy it but uh, we'll see. I'm going to be very interested to hear about that one. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, anyway, that was uh, Slay the Spire. Um, Qu yeah. Quick question, uh, Alexis. You said you lowered your pledge. Uh, how low did you lower it? I'm currently at one dollar, and I'm probably going to uh, to drop it. Okay, like very low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, I, I I kept one dollar just to keep an eye on the the um, uh, their news and see if they have any feedback. But I'm probably just not going to uh, to get the full game at all. Okay. So now we have escaped the spire and laid the beating heart at the top to rest. Let us go to the stars. It's time for terraforming Mars. And before I start on with the board game, I would like to express my surprise that in... I, I know I'm not very big on social media, like I'm not on the platform that should not uh, be named anymore. Uh, I'm not uh, very into Instagram board game stuff. I mostly do miniature stuff there. Uh, I'm not into board game discords. I'm mostly on Facebook and I barely, no, it's not barely, it's I didn't see anyone talking about the dice game Terraforming Mars. I saw the Kickstarter absolutely nowhere. It's just one day I was browsing Kickstarter and it was suggested to me and I was like, what? They are turning Terraforming Mars into a dice game? A, a dice board game. And I was completely surprised not to have heard of it at all uh, after all the success of uh, Terraforming Mars itself and the big box and all the deliveries of the big box when I saw it with the um, metal... Uh, cubes and the uh, controversy of them being individually packaged. I saw that a lot and then the dice game, pff, nothing to be seen. I was very surprised. D did you guys see anything? Um, no, not really. Uh, I'm wondering if all the problem with Ares Expedition, which I don't think it's a bad game, but it definitely drew a lot of like mixed opinions, maybe wore people out on it. And it looks like it looks like people are even less hot on this dice game overall okay so not 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 just me okay yeah, but... yeah no no not really no uh, it, interestingly it seems like they're just following the path that race for the galaxy did because race has role for the galaxy and role for the galaxy is genuinely really good all by itself yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, that was the Dice uh, Terraforming Mars game, which I didn't even keep track of when it's going to deliver, but it's going to happen at some point. Anyway, Terraforming Mars, now the board game classic one, the ones that's been living in our shelves for a few years now, and I think we have all played it. Yep, I've played it. I've uh, got the big box, but I got the big box in retail. I'll have some comments about that if you give me some space. And I also play the computer game implementation of it, which is really good. Yeah, Alexis said no. 
Okay. I do own the board game and the video game on Steam. I did not pick it up on Epic when it was available a few weeks or months ago. Um, so it's a game where, as the title says, you're transforming Mars. What a genius. Um, the idea is to transforming Mars through three uh, parameters, which are going to be lowering the temperature putting uh, some oxygen in it and adding oceans. That's the way it is uh, constructed. When all these three parameters are on top, the game ends. Each player will contribute to, low, uh, to um, not lowering, but increasing uh, these parameters through adding oceans, through cards or some unlocks, increasing the temperature generally through cards, uh, heat or unlocks, and uh, putting oxygen, uh, most of the time it is through putting forests on the map, uh, through cute uh, hexagon tiles. So the way the game plays is every character, every player has a company. You can have basic companies from for start, which are all the same, with no special ability, or you can have special uh, companies, uh, which will give you, let's say, a small pointer in that you can go into the direction of, let's say, working for putting forests on, on Mars, which are going to be slightly easier uh, depending on uh, the company that you own, and. Um, you are investing money, investing resources, investing uh, components, investing materials to make Mars a completely viable planet. And uh, each player has a board which will basically tell them each turn how many of the different resources, aka gold, uh, different metals, uh, plants, uh, heat and energy, they generate. So each turn, the players will generate the corresponding amount of resource that is indicated on their board and then spend it doing generic actions, doing specific actions and or playing cards to increase the oxygen, increase the temperature, put water on Mars, put forest on Mars, etc, etc. The way the game plays is very simple. You will have ha ha as many turns... Ha you will have as many turns as needed to increase the free terraforming parameters to the maximum. If at some point there is one parameter that is not at the maximum and the player spent three turns not putting it to the maximum, it can happen. It's, it works. You may want to delay the end of the game to reach that special goal. And so at every turn, the players will all take actions in turn until everyone can't play anymore or decides to stop playing, which might be a uh, tactic. So it might be at some point one player alone playing three actions because all the other players have decided to stop playing for this turn. The different actions, there aren't actually that many. Uh, there is always the action of playing a card. It's very simple. You have a card in your hand. You uh, have all the prerequisites. Uh, some cards will ask you for a minimum uh, amount of oxygen or oceans or a maximum uh, amount of oxygen. Some bacteria, you can only use them when the amount of oxygen is low, for instance. Uh, if you fill the prerequisites, you play the card and you resolve it. And you add it to a pile of all the played cards that you did. Some of them will have symbols on them and uh, that will play into account into calculating points depending on how many symbols you have, that kind of thing. You can always have some standard projects, I'm not sure it's called the same in English, but in French it's Projet Standard, which are basically you can always spend some um, mega credits to increase the oxygen, to increase the temperature. It's a basic thing, but it generally costs much more than cards. Uh, but if you don't have a card and are locked by something, you can still do that. You can uh, always convert plants into forests. So if you have a certain amount of plants, eight uh, on your board, you can convert them to a forest. You spend them and then you put a forest tile on the map. You can always do exactly the same uh, to convert heat into temperature. You take the eight heat on your board and you convert it to temperature and you increase the temperature uh, level. You can use some card actions. Some cards do um, um, one shot actions, uh, effects, and some cards are always available to redo it, like you can add a token on it, you can do some effect, that's an action, and the two last uh, actions possible are basically uh, do an objective or a reward, these are uh, things that are um, on 
the board and generally it's spending a certain amount of credit to either unlock the objective or unlock the reward. If you do the reward, it's uh, something that uh, you will unlock it, but at the end, the player that has, let's say, the uh, biggest amount of uh, mega credit production will win. So you might give the goal to unlock it, but someone else might get the rewarding points at the end. And for the objective, it's if you have the um, certain amount of terraforming level, of uh, cities on Mars, you can pay it and you will get that reward. So these two things, objectives and reward, work a bit in a different way. And sometimes you might want to calculate stuff to make sure of how you will um, score at the end. Speaking of score at the end, how do you score at the end? It's very simple. Everyone starts at a terraforming level of around 20, maybe 21. Um, and every time you do something that increases the terraforming level, you increase it uh, in the corresponding way. Every time you put an ocean, every time you increase the oxygen, every time you increase the temperature, and some other effects can uh, help you do that. And at the end, you add all the extra points scored from uh, tokens, uh, from uh, final um, calculations, from the objective, from the reward, etc. And that's where you might want to delay something because at the end, you might be able to do a very last move which will give you an extra token, which will grant you that point that will put you over the other player. So that's where I suck at the game because I can't calculate anything at the end. And anyway, there are so many badges, so many points uh, spread across uh, some cards that I just can't calculate how many points my opponent will have. So I'm just like, oh, I'm going to finish the game and see how things go. <laughs> um, I played it two players, I played it three players, and I tried the solo mode on uh, the video game. I am very bad at the solo mode. Uh, I do have fun uh, in two or three players, even if I don't win. I don't really care. I like building my engines. I like putting cities on the, on the map. I like doing stuff. Uh, I don't really mind. But when I play a solo game, my aim is really to, to work it to the end. And that's where, in my opinion, the engine building, the resource generating... Um, Engine is very difficult for me because you have a certain amount of time to do the free uh, terraformation uh, bits and there is no other player to help you get faster there. So you do have to make it on your own and, and I struggle at it. I still haven't won one. I, I haven't done too many of these, but yeah, I, I, I can't get it. I think it's a very hard solo mode. It is, it is a difficult solo mode. You have 14 generations, 14 turns to get everything done to terraform Mars. Um, yeah, it's it's not easy, and randomness on the order you get the cards in can really just make a potential win impossible. Yeah, it's if, fun, if, if, but... you, if you get only cards with a requirement at the beginning, you're looking at your hand and, well, shit. <laughs> yep, I better get out my shovel and start digging through these cards instead of digging through the Earth of Mars. Yeah, it's um, it, it, I I do appreciate that it is such a tight frame on a solo game i like solo games that say you've got x number of turns to get this done um even if they beat your own score uh, it feels fun to have that that cap yeah yeah i have i have done it i have won the solo game but i've definitely Woo! lost the solo game more than i've won by quite a bit <laughs> yeah um i feel less bad now it shouldn't. It is. It's difficult. You've got a whole load of different engines to put together in a game that usually has other people semi-cooperating with you on doing all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, it is. It is. Um, you've got to swing big, and uh, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. Yep. So yeah, that's all for my thoughts. Uh, Fan, you said you wanted to talk about the big bugs, I think, and expansions, maybe. Um. Well. When it comes to the expansions, I've got them all mixed in, and I always forget which ones are like oh. good. Um, I I th think if I remember correctly, it's the one that gives you the starting like bits to get you going a little faster. That's very very good. Um, I'm trying to remember what the name of that one. I think it's Prelude. Prelude. That's it. Yeah, it's, uh, Prelude is like a big firm recommendation from me. I think that one's fantastic. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the big box because I missed out on the Terraforming Mars Kickstarter for the big box. 
because at the time I just didn't have the funds and um, it was just one of those, there were so many Kickstarters at the time, I think. Uh, but I knew it was coming to retail and I was like, okay, fine, it'll hit retail. I can miss out on a couple of exclusives, that's all right. Um, and I picked up the Nordic version, quote unquote, and I have talked about this on podcast previously, which turned out to be the English version with a Nordic sticker stuck on the wrap on the outside. So it's just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal. A lot of the board games sold in the Nordic countries are sold and played in English, especially in Sweden. There's like very few games I've managed to pick up exclusively in Swedish. Mostly it's Ticket to Ride. Like I've got Ticket to Ride New York and Ticket to Ride London in Swedish. Um, But my problem with the big box was once I started putting all the bits and pieces from the game into the big box, it was clear there's just like loads of dedicated areas for kickstarter exclusive stuff and i was like i I expected one or two but i didn't expect to kind of have a third of the box with just empty plastic wells that are like here's where my stuff would be if i had it so yeah. i don't I, I like the i, I i'm not totally disappointed because the plastic tiles that you put down on mars make me happy and really does add an extra layer to terraform in Mars. And it, I think mechanically it's just, it's because you're putting hexagons down, you know, um, some there's, there can get some awkwardness when you're putting hexagons down flat ones next to other ones, you know, if they're cardboard tokens, if that makes sense. Yeah. When they've got uh, plastic and they've got a little bit of three dimensions to them, it's a little easier to put them down um, and just be more tidy and organized. And it's satisfying to look at the end and be like, there's our Mars. This bit down here has all this nice stuff on it, and up here is a ton of plastic. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, three-dimensional, I do regret that the player boards uh, in the base game are not double-layered, because for your production, it gets very messy. Yep, yep, yep. They are... I mean, double-layered boards on anything where you're putting, like, stuff on tracks and things... Uh, Actually, ever since people started using double-layer boards, I think designers... Um, you know, the people actually doing the physical design of the board game should be going, is there any reason this shouldn't be double layered? Not, should we make this double layered? But de- double layered should just be the default. And Agreed. you should have a good reason to not do it. Or if you don't want to do double layered, cut holes into it and the, the table can be the second layer. It can be the bottom layer. That works as well. Just fine. Yeah, you definitely don't always need like a second layer. Just having a hole is perfectly fine. But the worst thing when you play especially an expensive board game is to having things on your board and then just tapping on the table and everything needs to be reshuffled around it just makes everything feels cheaper and less good quality for something that i'm pretty sure doesn't cost that much more per game yeah a little bump in the table and oh how much was my production of titanium i don't oh. remember oh, yeah. honestly i would i would get that every day over uh, custom made plastic tokens for every mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of resources i just need yeah. i just need little little uh, cubes that's perfectly fine i have imagination but i can't have the memory of my titanium production <laughs> yeah woe betide you if you have big long sweeping sleeves um that's one of the things uh, i liked about iss vanguard is you have these dice pools they did a double layered board and there was a space for every single dice because if you mix up those dice, then oh boy, it's a pain in the butt. But they made sure at least you'd have to really knock um, your board to knock those dice flying anywhere. And I appreciated yeah, that's, that. that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It starts with Carius does a similar thing. It has some of the best double layered boards I've ever seen. I love them. Big dashboard. You feel like you're piloting your ship you know, moving stuff around. And they're going from one well to another, so it's very hard to knock them flying. So, yeah. A lot, a lot of talk about the dashboards, but I still have the flat dashboards, and I hate them. And the, th- the double-layer ones n- keep going out sale at the moment they come in stock around here, so I can't even fix that problem. I've lost track of where I am in a game a few times. Um, How do you feel about the art in Terraforming Mars, Audrey? About what? The artwork, the card uh, design. Oh, the, the artwork. I, for me, it's it goes a bit in the Aeon Zen direction. Aka, very simple, quite uh, minimalist. And I don't really think that it needs more because it's it, the game does feel uh, semi-scientific. 
Uh, like, I mean, you don't stir from Mars uh, by just putting uh, bacteria on it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it does feel like, yes, there is some uh, scientific things on it. Uh, the different uh, species that you can put on the planet have uh, semi-reliable uh, requirements in terms of levels of oxygen, etc. So it does feel that there is a semi-good scientific basis on how it's built. So for me, the art does fit that. Uh, so I think it could be prettier. Yes, it could be, but does it need to be? I I don't really think so, to be honest. So I I, I am personally fine with it, especially that the game is what around fifty euros. Yeah, 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 it is. Uh, and I'm perfectly fine with the price point. Uh, if let's say a prettier game would have been a bit more expensive. No, please give me the double layered board instead of prettier art. <laughs> yeah, that's my uh, opinion on that. No, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Like, I'm one of the people who I'm. I I've read opinions from people who get like they don't like the artwork and they don't like the card design layout. And I've realised, although I'm not thrilled with it, it I, it never really bothers me. It's just there. Yeah. 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 Ex exactly. Yeah, it, it um actually reminds me of Ark Nova, and Ark Nova is basically Zoo terraforming Mars. <laughs> um, uh, I think with maybe you have your own board that you're building a zoo on instead of co cooperatively building, you know, terraforming Mars. But other than that, it has the same concepts of the big deck, and you gradually build up an engine. Um, that has like loads of clip art in it, and I think that might at times just look worse than terraforming Mars does, because I think at least terraforming Mars at times has stuff that feels like artwork instead of just clip art. Mm -hmm. uh, no, yeah. I I do not have. Uh... I have never played Dark Nova, so I definitely can't uh, compare that. But uh, I've seen enough uh, table pictures to get the idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's sometimes it's very fun and enjoyable. And if terraforming Mars is something you like, and but you're not totally sold on the theme, or you want more of that, then Dark Nova is probably the next stop. Um, but it's more expensive than terraforming Mars, so. I would go with Terraforming Mars first. Yeah. And I think that, that's all for Terraforming Mars. Um, while turning mask green is a mammoth challenge, it can also be difficult to turn your own house green. I killed a bamboo once! Really? Man. Yes, I, I did kill a bamboo one. It turned yellow and all soggy, and I was in a, in a room with... Not a lot of light, so I think that would explain it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, Fen, you have a more green hand. So what is Verdant from Flat Out Games? So Verdant is the third in this unofficial series that Flat Out Games have been putting out of random stuff in a marketplace that you have to put onto a grid or a board or a layout and deal with your own previous decisions and curse them so the first one we talked about on the podcast that's calico um which yeah. is very easy to get into and very easy to get yourself into a terrible mess um, <laughs> it and then there was cascadia which we've not talked about on here uh i'm gonna just go as far as to say cascadia is really good cascadia might be the one that gives you the hardest decisions um but we're talking about the third one here, which is Verdant. Verdant is all about growing plants. Now, before I get into the game, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the designing because I find it interesting because Calico is designed by Kevin Russ and Beth Sobel did the artwork. Um, and then Cascadia was designed by Randy Flynn and Beth Sobel did the artwork. And Verdant is designed by um, Kevin Russ and Molly Johnson and Robert Melvin and Aaron Mesburn and Sean Stankwich. And illustrated by Beth Sobel. So the common thread is Beth. Um, it's a bit interesting that this one's got so many designers compared to the previous two. And I'm not sure why that is. Because I I don't think this game is super complicated. Um, but who knows? It's one of those mysteries along with the mystery of what the heck is Satchel Quest. And why has uh, Flat Art Games never published it even though it's on Board Game Geek? And why does it have only one rating of a 1 out of 10? 
I'm, that's that, that's something that, it's a silly thing but it bugs me that it's on their page and i'm like is that really attached to them is it i mean it says players take on the role of adventurers in a roguelike bag building puzzle game that sounds like a modern design that sounds fun but the only person who has anything to say about it has rated it one with no comments and it has no time it's coming out so maybe that's knows? why there is a one maybe maybe who knows um possibly so anyway i've beaten around the bush a lot and not even answered your question which is what is verdant so verdant is um you, you're growing houseplants you are a houseplant enthusiast not a quilter not a person who's willing into being some space of wildlife in america which is cascadia no you're you're a houseplant enthusiast uh, you, this is a another one of those take your picks from market type game. Uh, you have two different decks of cards. One lot represent the plants, the house plants, and the other lot represent the rooms. You'll start the game with one house plant on one room. So the house oh, plants. I, I thought you said broom. Why? Broom. <laughs> yes, yes. You you line up all your house plants, and then you put you take your broom and you push them out the door because <laughs> house plants are for fools. Get plastic. No, no. Um, so you'll start with a room and uh, you'll choose one of the sides you'll put a houseplant on. So the houseplants, they have a colour, like a suit. Um, I think there's five different suits, uh, which are dark blue, light blue, kind of pinky, pur pinky purple, um, indigo, is it indigo? Or violet, whichever. Orange and... Yeah, I think it's... Yeah, yeah. And yellow. Anyway, they're like... Um, the if you're a blue, yellow, colorblind person, and there's not many, but there are some, this game's going to suck for you. But if you're red-green, you should be okay. Anyway, they, they have symbols also, so you can match the symbols. You have the five suits, and the, they have corresponding in the rooms as well. There are also those five, five suits. Your houseplant will have a pretty picture of it in a pot in the middle. It'll have... Um, at the top, the kind of light it likes, either full, half, or in the shade. And it will have a verdant score in the top right corner and victory points. So with these cards, you're trying to get as many verdant tokens onto the card as is in the top right corner. And then you get to discard all those verdant tokens, take a pot, which is worth bonus points, a pretty little extra token pot, and you pop it over the existing pot to make your plant prettier and it's worth that many victory points at the end of the game the rooms on the other hand they are a single color they have in the middle a space where you can put an item below that they have a reminder and they score you bonus points for putting plants of the same suit next to there so if you put orange plants next to an orange room then it'd be worth more points if you also put an orange tile into the orange room, I'll get to tiles a bit later, then you get actually get double the points. So one way you can score is by making, say, an orange in the middle and putting four orange plants around the outside of it. The other thing the rooms have is they have a different amount of light on each side of the room. And so as you put it down next to a plant, if you put the match inside that works for the plant, so say you've got a plant that likes to be in full sun and you've lined it up with a room with full sun on the side, then boom, the plant will get a verdant token. And that means you can get up to four verdant tokens onto your plants by placing rooms around them. The tricky thing is you're only allowed a maximum of three rows and five columns. And the game is going to last 13 turns, so you're going to have 15 cards at most. You can like build the grid however you like, so you don't have to have your two startings in the middle. They can be in the corner, on the side or whatever. It's up to you how you expand. But once you hit the maximum number of rows or columns, you're stuck. So that means a plant that needs like nine verdancy, how are you going to achieve that if you can only get four matching sides down? You can't. But that's where the other thing, the other little pieces come in. So there are also tiles and tiles come in two types. There are green tiles, which have various different ways of letting you put verdant tokens onto your plants. Fertilizer dumps three tokens onto one plant, whereas a trowel lets you pick three plants and put one verdant token onto each. So it kind of represents you tending to the plants. 
The other tiles are coloured to match the suits and they have a different picture on them. Uh, there's a cockatiel, a sofa, a goldfish bowl. There's even one of the cats from Calico on one of the tiles. And that's a whole separate point scoring game where you're first of all trying to get them to match the room colour they go in to get the double score for the adjacent plants. But you're also trying to get one of each different icon and the more different icons you get, the more points that's going to be worth. So I think you're already beginning to see suddenly now you're juggling where are my plants, where are my runes, what colour are my runes, what colour are my plants, what colour are my tokens, how verdant are my plants. And so it's just building up visually, it's very easy to track, but there's a lot going on. As it stands though, that would still be fairly easy to manage. So the real rub that Verdant gives you is in the market. So the market is three columns, uh, sorry, four columns and three rows. The top row is the houseplants. There'll be four cards there you can pick from. The middle row is tiles and there'll be four tiles you can pick from. And the bottom row is rooms, four rooms. When you pick, you get to pick one pair of a tile and one of the cards above or below it. One second. Yeah, uh, so you will, um, and just, just for my uh, co-hosts, I'm going to drop a picture of the market in. You can easily look one of these up on Board Game Geek, but it will, that's what it looks like for you guys. It's visually fairly clear, and you will be picking one tile and one of the cards either above or below it. So... You're all, Cascadia has the same mechanic, except you always get a tile and a given animal. This is a little more generous. You get some choices in what you're going to do, but you're, you sometimes have to make a compromise, especially with the rooms, because actually they get quite complicated when you're trying to find the right room for more than one plant at the same time, because it's touching, say, two plants or even maybe three. Um, so that's that's quite complicated. Um just to sort out in your head. And that's where like Calico and Cascadia Excel is what you're physically doing is very easy. I'm taking a card, I'm putting it in a grid, I'm taking a token, I'm doing something with it. And boom, oh God, this is the, where am I putting these things? So I like that head scratching. Sometimes it's really easy because the cards land the way you want them, but most of the time you are having to make compromises. Yeah. Is it okay if I, if I interrupt to ask a couple of questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, I'm kind of wondering um, how hard is it to afterwards count the points uh, when you do your, your fun little planned game? Uh, is it once you get to the end, do you need to pull out the calculator, basically? Not the calculator, no. Um, they do have a scoring pad so you can track all the different categories. Um, so scoring at the end is pretty easy. And actually knowing how well you're doing on a given category isn't too hard to follow but you can get a little lost in the weeds during the game. Ha. That was going to be my, my second question. It's like looking at the other player's board, uh, do you feel like you have a good idea of what you can do to, of where you are in the game and what you need to do uh, well, to, to uh, go behind the other, the other? Because that's the good thing about Calico is that it's very clear to, say, to see what's happening on the board and on other people's board, I feel. And you Agreed. kind of... Yeah, you, you, I think that Calico is one of the better game in that end because you can very quickly see, oh, this player is going ahead with this type of points. I could try to corner the market there and get more points there and I might be able to, to get ahead. I feel like it works well in that regard. Um, Verdant has so much more information that it can yeah, be hard, the... uh, but the, like that, I just um, shared a picture of a board partially in play. Um, so you can easily glance over and bit, see how many Verdant plants someone's already completed because they'll have pots on them with points. Yeah, um, and if there's already tokens, then yeah, yeah. okay. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. and this. you can easily look and go, like this, the image I've shared there, it's got two lamps. You can look at that and go, well, you two lamps doesn't matter. That's just one lamp. Um, because you need different unique ones. So they've got a cat and a lamp, and they've got four completed um, verdant plants. And if you look at the adjacency colours, you can see that the purple rooms are next to two matching plants in each. So you can work out that they're worth like two points uh, per thing each, so four points each extra. All right, so a little bit more complicated than Calico, mm -hmm. but still like very clear because the design is still so 
nice and, and it's pretty uh, it is very pretty it's very visual it's kind of fun when you put the little pot token on top of the existing pot in the picture um it, it's just sometimes the plant fits perfectly and sometimes it just you're like oh dear what what's happened like, <laughs> like the spider plant hangs all over the place but not when you put the pot on does um, either you or your partner um is into houseplants because my yeah. sister is very into houseplants so my question is that for someone that mm -hmm. likes houseplants is it a good game i've got this because my partner and her mother are really into houseplants and this is a game that i think um is very accessible for both of them because of how visual it is um that you can play easily and you can have that thing which which uh her mother has where she goes oh i don't know what i'm doing i don't know what i'm doing and then you turn up the scores and she's won well that's my uh <laughs> that sounds Christmas, like my mom. Christmas gift sorted mm -hmm. then yeah um i think it, because it's so visual uh and it's very easy with the colors it's very like just easy to click with but it has that it's a little more forgiving than cascadia and calico because you're picking two things at once but you're getting a choice of two out of three things to take um, there is another thing that also makes the game a bit more forgiving. There's a thing called green thumbs. Basically, whenever somebody takes a card, the opposite card from the same column then gets a green thumb on it. And if somebody else takes that later, they get the green thumb. And you could trade in two green thumbs for a verdancy token or to discard all the tokens from the middle and draw a new set. Or you can um, pick from like two different columns by spending them. So there's a little bit more of that mitigation of, oh, I'm in a bad situation, but I've got green thumbs so they can help me out, uh, which helps. I would say this is the gentlest of the three games. This is the one that's the most forgiving, but this is the one with the most noise as well. This one's a lot. There's a lot to think about. And you, you are um, let, let, let me just walk you through what you do to score at the end. So, um, like, the, the, the forgiving aspect uh, somehow mm -hmm. compensates the busyness of a game? Yes, yeah. Uh, so, on, once everyone's got 15 cards down, so that's after 13 turns, you'll stop and you'll score. Uh, you score your completed plant, so every plant that's got managed to get its pot on it because it's had enough verdant tokens will be worth a number of points. And then any leftover verdancy, like, um, converts into one point for every two. Then you look at your pots, and some of the pots are rarer than others. They're worth between three and one point. Terracotta pots are worth nothing. You horrible person, grow your plants faster. Then you check your room bonuses, which is matching plants with the right rooms, and you look if the item doubles it. Then you Oof. do a score uh, of an increased amount of points depending on unique furniture and pet tokens. Uh, then, um, if you have one of each different five plants in your thing, you get a bonus, and if you have... Uh, one of each different five rooms you get a bonus and um in, in a tie then the highest number left of a green thumbs wins it's Woo! that that's how many different things are going on but this game never feels overwhelming because all you're doing on a turn is picking a tile and picking a card and then you sit there and try and figure it out i think the hardest bit is trying to line up the right plant with the right position because um, I've played a few games now and it's clear you want easier to grow plants around the outside of your grid because they're, they're naturally going to get less rooms next to them. And you want your big, fancy eight, nine, ten point plants near the middle to give you as many chances as possible to grow them completely with the rooms. Um, honestly, I, I love reading all of the stuff out that's needed because... Hang on. <coughs> oh, shoot, I didn't mute myself that time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because it's so much going on. Uh, the, the, you, when you start scoring at the end though you're like okay okay and I think after like three games of this I was getting pretty good at working out what I was trying to do and at that point you can add in goals and there are three extra goals one for rooms one for plants and one for tiles and they score extra bonus points to one person who's managed to achieve that thing at the end of the game so there's a little bit more there uh, it's got a nice solo play version makes a great solo puzzle I think it has a whole achievement type system where four players can sit there and like colour in their own plant by achieving certain things during games if that appeals to you. Uh, and some scenarios where you play set goals and try and score a minimum score. It's, it's a very nice little package. Small box, same size as Calico. 
and I think I can recommend it to anyone who's interested. Um, and it reminds me, it's for some reason, of Tussie Mussy. But I think it's because Tussie Mussy involves cards and plants as well. That's verdant. That sounds like a wonderful game. I might definitely get that for my sister uh, for the holidays. Yeah, it's it's definitely on nearer towards the simpler gateway side of things, and you can kind of hide how complicated it it can feel at uh, a more experienced level by just you know gradually walking your, your the other people through what they're doing on their turn, and they'll slowly build up their knowledge of all the different interactions. Wonderful. Thank you, Fen. And with that sprink sprinkling from the water can, we are out of time for this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Last Standy. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Standy on YouTube or subscribe via your preferred podcast app. So it's farewell from Alexis. From Belgium. Au revoir. Fen? Bye. And myself, goodbye, and remember that the second E in Standy is for elephant ears. Oh, that's a type of house plant. <laughs> <laughs>